life you have people on occasion with whom you have contact and become friends who become a great partner, great ally in life, and such a person is Chaplain John Morris of the Minnesota National Guard. It's now my honor to invite him to introduce Colonel Shames. Mr. Secretary, elected representatives, senators, survivors and family members, General Nash, General Lloydall, Colonel Shames, Sergeant Seward, it's an honor to be here to introduce our guests. But before I do that, he will be the first to tell you that one individual does not win a war. And for the young people that are gathered in the gallery here today, occasionally evil organizes itself and personifies itself and marches against the free. And we have in our midst men and women who gave the best years of their lives to ensure that we have the freedom we have today. And those are our World War II veterans. We'd like to ask you to stand so we could recognize you here today. It's our honor today to welcome to Minnesota Colonel Edward Shames. Colonel Shames was a platoon leader in the famed 101st Airborne, the Screaming Eagles. He was a graduate of the most arduous training camp the American Army devised at Tacoa. Literally road marched 149 miles from Tacoa to Fort Benning to earn his airborne wings, and then off to Camp McCall then to England, and then jumped into Normandy, where he was the first American non-commissioned officer to receive a battlefield commission, and he walked out of Normandy as a second lieutenant. He served as a platoon leader, third platoon, easy company, the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, which was featured in the famed Band of Brothers HBO miniseries. He was also given the distinction, the sad distinction, of being the first American military officer into Dachau. Would you give a warm welcome today to our hero, Colonel Ed Shames. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? possibly compete with what has transpired here before I get up here. Very difficult. As I said before, I'm delighted to be here. Not really, because I left Virginia Beach. Sunday morning, it was 73 degrees, and my son said perhaps he might go to the beach and take a last dip for the season. And I came here. But I'm delighted to be here with you. As a matter of fact, at my age, I'm delighted to be anywhere and know where I am. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I didn't realize that there were so many of you people that would be interested to hear what we have to say here this morning. Where to begin? I guess I will start how the 506 came to discover these infamous concentration camps in Europe. We'd gone through Bastogne. In fact, the weather here reminds me of Bastogne, the Battle of the Bulge, where we froze to death about for 29 days with hardly any clothing whatsoever. I thought that was pretty awful until I saw what I saw later in my army voyage. After we left Bastogne, that was probably the last engagement of battle that the Americans fought with the Germans that accounted to anything. That was the last straw for the Germans. We were then slated to go to the Redoubt area. The Redoubt area was an area that 
the military figured that the Germans were to create a guerrilla warfare action near the Alps of Austria. On the way there, that phase of our journey, we came across, we did not liberate, we did not discover, we came across a very horrible odor on the highway. Very horrible odor. Some of you may remind yourself of the odors that you detect when you pass a paper plant, a mill. Miles away, you smell this thing that uh, you don't know what it is until you get to the paper plant. It's a pulp plant. Well, this was an odor that was 40 times as bad. We finally came up to this camp enclosure, and outside of the enclosing fence were about, I guess, if I remember, a line of boxcars, perhaps 50, 75. Some of our people were pretty curious as to what they were. They got out came back to the trucks and said there were bodies in these boxcars. There were most of them, in fact, most all of them were dead except the few living ones that were thrown in with the dead ones by the Germans from this area that we found out later was the Landsberg concentration camp. Now, if you don't, if you remember history, Landsberg was a jail that Hitler was confined to when he wrote Mein Kampf. We didn't know that then, of course. We were horrified at what we saw coming out of the camp. We think we saw bodies. Actually, they were moving objects. We wouldn't call them people because they were skeletons in rags, scarecrows. It was a horrible, horrible sight. I thought perhaps at that moment, it was the worst sight that I had ever seen. I thought until later when I saw what I did see the next couple of days. After we tried to do what we could for these inmates, all the wrong things, trying to feed them. Some of the guys went to the bakeries and cleaned the bakeries out brought food. Our medic said that was the worst thing we could do for them. A couple of hours later, grave registration people of the military came and took care, told us to go away because we were late doing more damage than good to these people. We were still on the way to this redoubt area near Salzburg, Austria. That evening, we bedded down our company platoon. A runner, a messenger from headquarters of the regiment, 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, came by my platoon and looking for Lieutenant James. I identified myself. He says, Colonel Sink wants to see you right away. I wondered what I had done because I, my unit was always getting in some kind of mischief. So I said, here goes. So I picked myself up, went to headquarters. Colonel Sinks, very somber. He said, James, have a seat. I've got a job for you. The third platoon, my platoon, happened to be the patrol platoon of the regiment. Patrol patroon meant that any nasty job, whether it's fighting or anything else, night patrolling, capturing prisoners, so forth, that was our job. We were trained for it. We knew our job. We did it well. And I was a fairly decent soldier. Colonel Sink says, uh, I hate to put this on you, but uh, you're the one, I think, that's going to tell me what I'm trying to find out. 
He says, been told to me that there is a headquarters camp or headquarters thing up ahead, a few miles from here. We'll vote, I guess, a uh, hundred miles from Munich. He said, that is the headquarters of all these little satellite camps that we came upon today. He said, I want you to go up there and determine what it is. Come back, meet us on the road. We're going on this road to Salisbury, pointed out on the map which way he was going. Take a jeep, get one of the soldiers that you have in your platoon. I had three very fine soldiers that could speak excellent German. They were born in a house that spoke German practically all their lives until they went to high school. One of them in particular was a corporal by the name of Corporal Fenstermacher from Fogelsville, Pennsylvania, right outside of Allentown. And of course, we used him quite a bit when we captured German prisoners, especially German prisoners in American uniforms. Incidentally, we did not give them a decent trial, but we did give them a trial called a 45, if you understand what I mean. He used to take the jeep, go up the road, and you do the rest. Yes, sir. The next morning we started out, about six o'clock in the morning. It was getting light. We went up this road for about 45 minutes. We came across this peculiar odor. And of course, we knew that we were getting close to where we were supposed to be. Sure enough, about five more minutes, we came across these 48 boxcars. 48 meaning they could carry eight animals or 40 people. There were hundreds of these boxcars outside of these this, uh, the walls of this camp, hundreds. We stopped, we looked inside, packed and jammed with dead people. We then went to the gate of this compound. The gates were open, the Germans had left. The Germans, as far as I know, left all of the camps. We did not liberate the camps. We found them. Corporal Fenstermach and I drove through, went in, and what we saw is a sight that no human being ever should witness in his entire life. What I saw at that moment, I've seen every night of my life for the past 68 years. I don't believe I will ever, nor will I want to forget it. Went through from one place to another. Again, we could not believe our eyes. Now, let me explain why I'm here in the first place. This is only the second time that I've spoken about the things that I'm talking about now. I would never ever participate in anything that had to do with the Holocaust as far as the death camps are concerned. I couldn't handle it. As I said, I saw it every night of my life. It was no honor, believe me. I would not discuss it with my children. They, of course, knew and know the situation. 
they've heard rumors and so forth from various people, but never when I've had I've had been offered to talk in Washington at the Holocaust Museum, Richmond Holocaust Museum, Norfolk, Virginia, and also Virginia Beach. Never would I touch it. Last February, I was sitting by my computer and I was telling people this morning that I've been working on computers for about, I guess, 15, 20 years. And I'm a computer expert. The only thing I'm still trying to figure out how to get the lowercase letters on that damn thing. <laughs> but I'll make it. The phone rang. I answered, it was about 10 o'clock at night, nine, eight o'clock in Phoenix, Arizona. A lady identified herself as so forth. And she wanted to know if I remember her. I said, yes, she was a family of friends. The entire family took care of the band of, bro band of brothers. Oh, incidentally, the band of brothers is a group that actually won World War II almost by themselves. We did get a little help from others, but we actually won the war, single-handed. If you don't believe it, read the book. So, then I remembered who she was, and I said, I thought you were from either Wisconsin or Minnesota. She said, I'm working here in Phoenix. I said, well, what can I do for you? She said that she understood that I was the first American officer in Dachau. And when she said that, I almost fell off the stool. I said, where in the world did you get that from? She said, oh, I've talked to my friend over here, and I'll introduce you to him later. He's sitting here. He's the boss of the band of brothers. Uh, whether she got it from him or not, but one of the guys doing the reunions that knew where I went that particular day, there are only six of us originals left of the band of brothers. There's about 18 all together, total. Six originals that started at the court Georgia. She said that, I said, well, what in the world? Uh, I said, we, I don't talk about those things. She said, I understand that, but I told the people that I'm working with now, a Holocaust group that are building a museum at Chandler, Arizona. And we want someone as a keynote speaker to kick this thing off. I said, lady, I'm very sorry, you're talking to the wrong person. I do not discuss it. I said, now if you want to discuss the upcoming Band of Brothers reunion, I'll be delighted to do it, but no more on this. And we talked a few moments, and we left it at that. I went back to my computer, maybe Providence, I don't know what happened, I can't explain it. One of the pop-ups on the computer showed that a gentleman by the name of Anthony Jones was to run for Congress of the United States from the state of Illinois, a district just below Chicago. And his credentials were that he that was the head of the Ku Klux Klan of that area. He was a fervent anti-Semite, known. He celebrated Hitler's birthday every year. He attended this group of meetings with a bunch of anti-Semites from his area, and he even had parades through the streets nearby. When I saw this, my blood boiled. I said, my God, here we go again. 
because I lived through a lot of this stuff during the 30s. There was nothing unusual at that time. I picked up the phone, called this young lady back, and I said, what in the world could I possibly do for you concerning your project? She said, will you attend? I said, absolutely. So that's where I started. I was invited to be in the keynote and channel, spoke to 1,700 people at this beautiful auditorium where they had outside a replica of one of the boxcars that was used to transport the Jews from various parts of Europe to the camps. They had it on display. They brought it from Europe. This is where they were going to build their memorial. That evening I spoke for an hour and 15 minutes and we had questions and answers for about an hour. After that, I came home, maybe relieved a bit of what I had done, and then of course, this came about. This is my second time. I had worked about a month on what to say, going through my mind of what I had seen, putting it all down on paper, perhaps thrown away maybe four or five lectures complete after working on them probably hours and hours at a time, thinking, I said, you can't do this to people. You can't possibly put this on them. You can't possibly try to paint a picture for them of what you have on these papers. So finally I came up with one I thought perhaps would be suitable. Wrapped it up, put it in my briefcase, came to Phoenix, picked up, taken to Chandler. People were very gracious, lovely, lovely people. Jew, Gentiles, what have you. This young hap lady happened to be a fine Christian lady. She was working for the Holocaust Commission. She was one of the lead people on raising money for this association, which I was very proud of. I got to the hotel, went over my talk that evening. I threw it away. I thought it was too rough to bring forth. Worked all night on another one. I thought I had it, and apparently I did because I thought I hit a home run. That's what they do in football, is it? I hit home runs. <laughs> Being as a football town. Anyhow, I gave the talk, and I looked at what I was going to tell today from that talk. There's only one incident that I want to relate to you. The others are just too horrible to talk about. This one is bad enough. When we got into the heart of the camp, incidentally, the colonel says you have two days to be there. Two days at that time was a lifetime for me and also for Fenstermacher, no different. He's also had, he died about two years ago. He and I got together by ourselves concerning this. We had, say, our own get together several times during the past 60 years. When we were in the camp, looking over everything, trying to figure out what in the world, how possibly. Human beings, to treat other human beings like this. Not only that, they had hundreds of townspeople that came from Dachau and Munich, working there. Working there all week and then going to church on Sunday. 
That boggles my mind. Finally, we decided to try to communicate with these people. People could not talk. They could hardly walk. Finally, the, the re grave registration people came in while we were there. We got a hold of this one particular German that looked like a, a Pol Polak, that looked like he could walk. And he was pretty viable on his feet. And he would talk with us. And through Fenstermacher, I asked, why do you look so well? He said he received more food than these people, if they received food at all. How come? He was a baker for the gods. His family owned a baker, not too, a bakery not too far from Dresden on the Polish border, inside the Polish border. He had 10 siblings, his parents, running this bakery in a small town. Zobry, I believe the name was, if I recall. Zobry, Z-O-B-R-Y, right inside of Dresden on the Polish side. They killed all of his family, all the siblings, his mother and father. They kept him to become a baker for the gods at that cow. So through the interpreter, I said, oh, that's where you got your food. Oh, no. By threat of death, I could not touch what I was baking. They gave me just a few extra morsels of the garbage that they were feeding the inmates. We also inquired, we saw this particular woman. I see her every night. Lady. She looked like she was 120. Who is she? She looked like she was completely crazy and dazed walking around. He said, she is used as our trophy here in that cow to show people around what's gonna to happen to them if they did not obey what they said. She had come into camp Two years, about two years, he thought, from the time we were there, with her daughter of about 11 years old. As they were being processed, the guards wanted to take her daughter from her, and she refused. She held on to that daughter until one of the matron guards came up took her away from the mother, threw her down on the floor, stomped her to death until her guts came out of her mouth. Now this is just a small example of what I can tell you, but I think that is enough for one day. Where we go from here, I do not know. I've lived a long life. I've seen a lot. I've seen most of it. I've had a wonderful life. Thank God for this country. I hope I've given them something back for what they've done for me. I appreciate being here, but before I go, I'd like to introduce to you one of the members of my platoon, a gentleman by the name of Herb Seward, known as Junior Seward. He holds, and I have to read this to you, the Legion of Merit. It's a French, highest French medal given to him by the French government by, for his service in the United States Armed Forces during World War II. Her please.
you're an embarrassing now, you're embarrassing him. He doesn't deserve all of that. Uh, I want to thank all of you, and I want to thank my hosts. They have been absolutely magnanimous, all of them. Steve, the general, my Colonel Chaplain. Incidentally, I was praised and also prayed for by about how many, 50 chaplains yesterday? So I am absolutely going to heaven, no question about it. Thank you very much. God bless.